Let me introduce you guys to our first guest today. This is Erica Paradis. She is a former fashion and beauty editor, turned trained chef, graduating from Le Cordon Bleu in Paris. She's a mother. She is a lifestyle writer. She's the first guest on my podcast, which has no name yet, <laughs> and she is a new restaurateur here in Paris. With the opening of your new restaurant、yes. called Reina, which is set to open around May sixth. Yeah, around May sixth. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm really like honored that you would choose me to be the first one. Absolutely. To you, so thank you. Well, first, I think your story is so beautiful, and I would love to share it. And I would love for other people to know more about you. So. Before we begin, I wanted to ask you, and I want—I'm looking at my paper because I want to make sure I pronounce this correctly. Could you tell us who Alice Mamban Mamban Ta is, and why she's so pivotal to the story that you're going to be sharing? Okay, so Alice Mamban Ta is my maternal grandmother. I was very close to her growing up. She was my neighbor; like she lived two blocks away from me. Literally, every time I would fight with my mom, I would like I'm running away, and I would run over to my grandma's house.、Mm-hmm. And my mom knew I was there, so she'd just be like, "Whatever, you're running away for two days. I know,、right. I know she's gonna send you back home soon." But every time I was there, it was like, I don't know. My grandma just was so loving and so nurturing, and she welcomed everybody into her home,、mm-hmm. like even boyfriends that we would bring that. Didn't need to be welcomed. She would、yeah. still be like so accommodating to everybody, and you know she always had little snacks and she was always making pies and like food and whatever. Basically, you could go there and and go home with like bags of groceries <laughs> because she always had food around. And I would just, I just loved spending time with her.、Mm-hmm. I would travel with her. I would just go there. I would sleep over all the time. Yeah, and. You know, like I always thought that she would be there for most of my life, and、um, sadly, she passed away when I was about, I think I was twenty-two,、mm-hmm. and it was two years before, few a few years, maybe three years before I had my own daughter, who I actually her second name is Alicia, which is for my grandma. Yeah, she never met,、mm. uh, she never met her, but you know, I was so sad when she died, and to this day, like. Mm-hmm. It's been twenty years now. She's still so like in me,、mm-hmm. you know. And we I can see it because I see it. it. I think this new restaurant is kind of a homage to her, right? Yes,、also. definitely. I think her and you know all the you know the women that raised me, my mom, my grandma, even my nannies growing、mm-hmm. up. You know, like I feel like the Philippines is a very matriarchal.、Um, Country, yeah. Well,、like. let's let's get into that. So, you're born in the Philippines and you're primarily raised there. But in your twenties, you ended up moving around a lot. You were、yeah. living in the United States, in London, Australia, and your mom was a caretaker, lived at home, which is a beautiful responsibility. And your father, which a lot of people might not know this, but is a very Jim Paradise is a very famous singer. Yeah, in the Philippines, which was. Incredible to discover. <laughs> so I wanted to start this off, you know, by really understanding your story. So could you take us to five-year-old Erica? Because something starts there. It's、mm-hmm. almost like this career. So tell us about five-year-old Erica. What you're doing at this time? <laughs> well, I think my my life of working or having a career started when I was five years old. Almost、uh, when I was five years old, I started in gymnastics、uh, for fun. I was super hyper as a kid, and I was always jumping around, like from the couch to the floor. I was climbing trees, and you know, like every time I'd see a ladder, I would try to climb it. And my mom was so scared that I would hurt myself, so she put me in gymnastics to kind of release all of that、mm-hmm. energy that I had. And I ended up being a gymnast for like twelve years of my life, and. I was a Philippine national athlete at some point, so I represented the country. I was competing, and that's why I say my career started like in working started at five because it really felt like work. Right. And but what was this period like for you as a young girl? Do you how was that world? I'm so unaware of what that world is like. But was it hard? Was it difficult? Was there pressures unknown and unforeseen for you that you At that time, could you even recognize that there was pressure being put on you, or was it fun? 
it was fun until it wasn't you know i think you're young when you start things it's super fun and then it becomes serious and sometimes you're like i don't want to do this anymore and i mean there was a time i really blamed my parents for keeping me in gymnastics mm. but then like as an adult and like having my own kid i realized that you know when you see your child excelling at something you're not just you know you want to encourage them and I don't blame them anymore, obviously. Like they were being parents and they were very proud of me. But mm -hmm. I think at that time I was so young and I didn't know how to properly express that yes, I was stressed. Yes, like this is too much pressure yeah. on a 10 year old, you know? Like I did not live a normal life right. as a kid. Like mm -hmm. I wasn't just going to school and playing after. I was going to school and then training for eight hours. Yeah. Like my friends were my gymnastics friends. Mm -hmm. My school friends I only saw at school. And then was I didn't really know anybody. I, f I felt like nobody really knew me at school because I was never like doing the after school activities, you know, like school would be so lenient with me, like because they knew I was competing. So if I was absent, ah, it's fine. Like just give her homework to turn in. Like, right. It was a normal. Plus, you know, like on top of that, my dad was famous. So. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd go, I couldn't even go to the mall with him. Right, because you were feeling the sense of not only were you having success, but also your dad was part of this huge, you know, he does pop songs and he's really well known. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't known at that time, but it was my dad. And like, right. we'd go to the mall, he'd be like, I need to buy socks. And then he'd get mobbed at the mall. And I'd just be like, I can't even spend time mm -hmm. with my dad, like a normal person. Oh, I see what you mean. Because I was also thinking that maybe you've had your own success up until that age that you were also thinking just for me, internalizing it I feel already I'm at a place where I'm doing so well but no I oh, as a kid like you, you were, know I don't think I was thinking that I was just like this is fun I'm with my friends and then like why are my parents still making me do this yeah. or whatever or I'm scared because my coach is like forcing me to do this thing and I'm too scared to do it I mean you think about it like gymnastics is so physical and you could mm -hmm. really get hurt mm -hmm. <clears throat> sorry and um of course, you kind of don't think that you're not thinking all these things as a kid when it's happening. Mm -hmm. But there's certain fears that I developed after. So this is interesting because <clears throat> I think you it's around this time. I think you're around 16 where you end up having kind of your first therapy session. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. And do you feel like that was because of just the pressures that you had from gymnastics? Definitely. Mm. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. completely. Yes. Do you remember that therapy session? <clears throat> yeah. The first time I went, my parents like forced me to go. I didn't want to go. I mean, this was the nineties and I was 16. Nobody was going to therapy Nobody. and admitting it at that Nobody. time. But you know? now it's a very welcoming idea yeah. and encouraged. But exactly. at that time, it's like something's wrong with you. Yeah. And I was like, my parents think I'm crazy. Like, why are they making me like they can't handle me? So they're like sending me to somebody to, to talk to or whatever. And I mean, in retrospect, it's honestly one of the best things that my parents ever did for me because now I am super pro therapy, even when you're not going through something. Sometimes like you're not depressed or anything, but you're just kind of going through a lot and you need someone to talk to. You can just mm -hmm. go to like a couple of sessions and then you're kind of OK. Yeah. Like um, and it sets the path for your future to understand your emotions better exactly. and be able to deal with them. So in hindsight, this experience that you have when you're young almost sets you up for the future issues that are going to come your way, yeah. you know, let's go a little bit towards your college years, you know, so you're 16, you're done with this career. Yeah. So take us to Erica college years, you know, in this college years, you end up really having a few different jobs, but what was college like for you? Which we say college, but in France, we it's, also know it as university. Yeah. So how was, how were the college years for you? Um, to be honest, I, I wasn't much of a school person. Like I went to school because I had to, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't like, oh, I want to get good grades. I didn't care. Like I, I wanted to just pass mm -hmm. so I could get to the next grade and my parents wouldn't bug me. Like I was busy doing gymnastics. And then after I quit, I was like too busy being depressed mm -hmm. and like being like, why is everyone like trying to tell me what to do all the time? Like yeah. I, I just felt that like for so many years like my weight, like everything, because you're an athlete, you know? Right. So it still stayed with you that period yeah. in your life from being a gymnast. It felt like, did you feel like you weren't sure of what you wanted to do in college? So you were trying to figure that out by trying different <clears throat> things and understanding like, what do I study? What do I do? 
Do you feel like you went through that period? I went through that period. And so I'm wondering if you had similar experiences. I, a little bit. I knew I wanted to write. Like for sure, for sure, for sure. Like writing's always been an outlet for me. Like even as I think my first diary was when I was like eight or nine years old and mm-hmm. I had stacks. Like it was funny reading them as an adult. Like this is what I did today. I'm so stressed because and I was laughing like my problems were so trivial. But yes. I mean, that's being a preteen. That's mm-hmm. being a teen, you know, but I'm glad that I kept all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really understand you. You know, during your last year of college, though, things kind of change. Mm. And that's really, it feels like where there's moments in our lives where everything changes, like the trajectory of which direction we're going in changes. Tell us about that year. What happens? You get a job (laughs) offer, you, you know... You yeah, so I get a job offer because I, I. What were you? What were you studying? What were you studying right now in college? What were you uh, kind of mingling with? Writing a little bit of creative yeah. activity, right? Like communication. Communication. And stuff. Yeah. So I did a lot of courses that were like advertising. Like I was trying to dabble in what kind of writing I wanted to do. And honestly, I really wanted to do script uh, screenwriting for mm-hmm. like movies and television and stuff like that. Because at that time, I felt like the the Philippines didn't have good TV shows. Mm-hmm. Like they were all like, "Why am I watching this?" I wanted to kind of like do scripts for like yeah. the dialogue and and all of that stuff. And um, I my cousin, like a second cousin, was an editor for like a teen magazine at that time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and she goes, do you want to write for us? I'm like, okay, I mean, I'll try. Yeah. So I wrote one article and I was like, you don't have to use it, but you can. And anyway, they they, they published it and she started asking me to do more. Mm-hmm. And I was still in school then. And then I got a job offer from the same company. Yeah. They're opening another magazine and they're like, oh no, you know, we're looking for, for someone to be a, a, an assistant editor, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I was just like, why not? Like Why not? I, I, I was on my last semester of school. Mm-hmm. It was kind of a, a lighter load. And I was like, I'm going to take a year off and then just work. My parents were not happy about that. Right. But like I said, I never really cared about school. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's not important. And I like even with my my daughter, we'll, we'll get back to that later. Yeah, because this is the year <laughs> exactly. where so many things happen in your life that yeah. set up the course for, you know, what's mm. happening now. So yes, take, yeah. us, take us there. So I even tell my daughter, it's super important. Like, you don't have to know what you want to do, yeah. but just like, I realize now that a big part of school is just social skills, networking and yeah. like life skills, you know, it doesn't matter what you're really taking up unless you want to be a doctor, of course, or, or something like that. And I know? think you can agree that to this day, I wish that they would teach so many more things about, you know, your personality, how to emotionally navigate yeah. life. That's so much. Maybe it's happening now because in our generation, those weren't kind of the pillars of what education no. was. But it now, wasn't important. No. And we had to like literally like figure things yeah, out. Yeah, you know, own. even a breakup with a friend is a hard thing to digest yeah. and understand. And so emotionally, you don't know how to navigate through mm-hmm. that, especially at such a tender age. College is still so young. Yeah. So let's go back there because we can probably go off I on know. all these <laughs> tangents. So you get this job, but then another, <clears throat> you know. Yeah. So I get this job as and a fashion then, and beauty editor. Yeah. And um, I end up getting pregnant. And at that time, for some reason, you know, I'm like... And you're 24 at this time, right? I'm 24. And I was like, you know, most people would be like, you're 24. Like, why are you going to have a baby right now? And I had broken up with her dad like a few weeks before I mm-hmm. found out I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to tell him, but I was like, of course, I have to tell him, you know? And yeah. But you know what? I never even thought of like not having her like never and I was like am I crazy like I'm literally on my first job getting so little money how am I gonna raise a kid it's not like France guys where everything's free like school Mm -hmm. and what no we have to pay for everything in the Philippines yeah and I'm like but you were certain you just knew it was a feeling like I'm going to do this you know there's also another storyline here where you you have to tell your parents. Oh yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> that I feel like was a was, how was that experience? Because I imagine you're worried. You know, you're pregnant. You're not really showing them. They don't know physically that you're pregnant. Yeah. But there comes a moment where you need to tell your mom and dad. I mean, obviously, like yeah. I remember visiting my parents' house and um, 
their their cook was like you look like you're gaining weight <laughs> and i was just like oh my god yeah. i was three almost three months at that time and i'm like i really need to tell my parents already like yeah. i can't hide this anymore and i didn't not tell them just because i was scared i mean i was but also at that time my mom had cancer yeah she your had mom was breast diagnosed cancer. with breast cancer at yeah. this time like almost the same time i found out i was pregnant right so this is the year where you've stopped college because you want to continue working in your in your career you get pregnant mm-hmm. you're going you realize you're going to raise this you know your daughter alone you have to tell your parents and your mom is also sick so yeah. that's a lot to navigate yeah. through what happens the day that you tell your mom and dad it was i was so i was super scared i was at their place i slept over for the weekend and I remember getting on the phone with my actually I told my aunt already. My yeah. mom's youngest sister is only 14 years older than me. So she's always been like my older sister since I don't have one. Mm-hmm. So I'm like I don't know what to do. I was crying on the phone and I was like I need to tell them today. And she goes, "Breathe, you can do it." Yeah. And so I go up to my parents' room and my dad's on the phone, my mom, I still remember it like in my head. Mm-hmm. My mom's on the on the bed watching television and I come in. And you could see that I'm like <laughs> shaking and stuff and I'm like I have something to tell you. First thing my mom said was, "Are you pregnant?" Oh, a, a mom's intuition. I know and I just started bawling and I'm like, "Yes, you know whatever." Yeah. And my dad sees me crying. He doesn't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. I hear I have to go. And then he puts he's like, "What happened?" And yeah. then you know, and they never got mad at me. No. Like I was so scared that they were going to be like and in contrast your dad was supportive and also encouraged you because you said I'm not going to finish college I don't need to but your dad really steps up and says you need to finish yeah. college you need to do this because it's going to be something that's going to be important yeah. I don't care you know how pregnant you are you need to finish <laughs> this do you feel like that was a good decision to finish yes, up college definitely okay. and it was a good decision to do it before I gave birth because mm-hmm. I he was like you're never going to finish right. after this baby comes out So I actually graduated like seven and a half months pregnant, mm-hmm. and I was like, I don't want to march on stage and get my diploma. Yeah. Like, first of all, it wasn't like my grade. Like, mm-hmm. you know, all my friends had had gone already. I was like, what am I gonna do there? Everyone's gonna right. be so excited. And I guess that was like my dad's punishment. No, you have to do it. I want to yeah. see you up there with your diploma in your hand. Mm-hmm. I looked like a whale. I was like, definitely, <laughs> definitely. You know, let's talk a little bit about food because this is the type time where you're also working. So you're yeah. in your corporate job and I think you mentioned that time management becomes important for you. You mm-hmm. know, there's a moment you're still in the Philippines, you're in your 20s, you have Ananda, yeah. you're raising her by yourself, you have the support of your family, but you're also learning about time management. We you know, and I always feel like in life things will happen that set you up for what's to come in the future yeah. because what you're dealing with now I imagine is so many different elements of running your own restaurant but tell us about food you started doing some free caterings right and i'm curious to know about this part because you're working in your corporate job i think you're kind of like in your 20s 30s yeah. now and you started doing free catering because you maybe just didn't believe that <laughs> people would pay for the food what yeah. what what was that period like what was the how was food a part of your life at this point because when ananda was born were, am i saying her name correctly you were cooking more for her but yeah. you were also doing these i'm very curious about that catering mm. period of your life um so i always like to cook like i come from a family that likes to cook there's no chefs in my family like before me but i don't know i always i think Filipinos or Asians generally like it's a big family thing you know it's it's part of your life where people are just in the kitchen so it's always been something that I dabbled with and then as I got older especially when I lived on my own and I had to really like feed myself yeah. more than instant ramen all the time I learned how to cook and realize that wow I can cook like yeah. I can cook well like my mm-hmm. flavors are good and everything and actually in my early 20s before I got pregnant My family was like, "Do you want to go to Paris for like to Le Cordon Bleu for culinary school?" Mm-hmm. And at that time, I was like, "No, I want to be a writer." Like, yeah. for me, cooking was just something that I super enjoyed doing on the mm-hmm. side, and I was like, "I want this to to remain like my passion, and I don't want to get stressed from it." Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. something I do to like de-stress. 
Look at me now, but yeah. <laughs> so you're at this time you're still in your you're you're in your job. Yes. But you end up kind of switching because you know you mentioned that you when you're a few fashion and beauty editor you're not really generating a lot of income. No. And so for you you wanted a more of a corporate career. So you end up going to this company in a kind of a corporate way, which is a French company. Yeah. A friend tells you about it. Yeah. But you're still. It feels like you weren't happy. Mm -mm. You know what was this like? What so you were doing this job, but you didn't take food seriously at this time. No, it wasn't a serious profession for you. No, I, I was still kind of like I actually had like a, a. I was running from home like this cupcake business. I was selling cupcakes, and I had like all these flavors, like fun flavors, mm -hmm. and I would do all the deliveries on my own, like just kind of like how I was doing. Takeaways during confinement. It was that kind of thing, yeah. and only on my free time. So I'd message people, or put it on Twitter or Facebook, like just for friends. Like, hey, I'm making these flavors this weekend. Only this many. Mm -hmm. Let me know if you want it. Right. You know, you can come pick up or whatever. So I think I've always like liked to share my food, mm -hmm. but the cupcakes I sold. But then you mentioned earlier the catering. I was doing that for friends. Like they'd be like, oh, I'm doing a housewarming, or I bought a new office and we're doing this. I can you like cater for us and I'd just be like I'm there's like actual caterers right. out there I'm like no but I really like your food mm -hmm. and at that time like I didn't even know how to portion things for people like how much should I make I don't know Definitely. like for and I didn't take more than 15 people I was mm -hmm. like I can't handle more than that mm -hmm. I was in my home kitchen I didn't even have storage you know I was like right. how am I gonna do this and I didn't charge mm -hmm. I would basically charge for cost right I'm like what's your budget like just If you were to do this on your own, she's like, oh, I'd probably spend this much money. I'm like, okay, give me that, and I'll spend yeah. all of it on ingredients. And did you enjoy that? I did so much. See, that's so interesting because whenever I talk to people or I do interviews, there's always a moment where it's interesting and you're like, oh, I love this, but we don't dive into it because for some reason we don't feel like it could be a reality. Yeah. And I feel like maybe that's something that it might have you know slipped into your mind, but it wasn't taken seriously until later. So. You know, you're in these jobs and you're just like, one thing you mentioned was you were tired of working for other people. Yeah. You know, you were just like, this is not for me. I'm in these corporate positions. Yes, I'm making a little bit more money, but I'm just not mm -hmm. happy. So this job that you're at, you know, you first, it's really your fashion editing job. And then you go into this more corporate position. You go on an interesting trip. You go on a trip, an extensive trip to Europe yeah. for about three months. Your family, you know, it's a kind of a birthday gift from Your parents were yeah. like, you need to take this trip now. You're yeah. getting too old for yeah. us to give you free trips. You go on this trip and it feels like you're just not, you know, you're enjoying your life. You you yeah. go to France. You You've already been to France before. This is the second time. Yeah. How was that trip for you? It was so great because it was me and my two siblings. And this is why my parents were like, my family was, do it already. You guys are like in your 20s, 30s. Like, yeah. It was a college. It was a college graduation present to all of us, mm -hmm. basically, and we could have done it separately, but we're like, let's do it together. Yeah, and we waited like a decade to actually do it, and you know, at that time, I was like, it's now or never, mm -hmm. and I was with that corporate job. I managed because my job was very computer based anyway. Which after a while I'm like I can't just sit here in front of a computer all day. I was dying. You were listening to rap music. Yeah, and you wanted to dance, and you were just like I can't be in this no, environment. I can't because before that, my job as an editor it was more, more animated. I imagine. Yeah, like you know, we were listening to stuff like. It was a big publishing company, so I was in a fashion and beauty magazine. But next to us was like a more lifestyle mm -hmm. and like magazine for social lights for here it's like a gossip magazine so everyone's just like talking mm -hmm. to each other all the time and it's very lively and then i get to this like corporate job and everything's everyone's like on their headphones i'm sure listening to yeah. music but like no one's talking to each other and it's silent and, and it I'm doesn't like, correspond to who you are no i was just like man like mm -hmm. sometimes in the middle of the day you just want to like Be like, hey, you know, like just yeah. five minutes talk to someone about what you did last weekend, mm -hmm. and nobody was like that, you know. So, so you're anyways, on this trip. Yeah, we go to Europe, and and I was and for three months, I just took off for three months. I was still working, you know, and I was just like, I I just I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, you know, like I 
had so much I know it was vacation so it's different you know mm-hmm. and it's the same thing I tell people when they say I want to move to Europe I'm like it's not that easy mm-hmm. when you're actually living here but I just felt like I need to do something new in my life and there was a different calling that was starting to happen for you because on the flight back you really did not want to go back to your job you didn't no. want to go so is it on the flight does something happen where you make a decision on that flight where you think Actually, you know, that that trip with my siblings was 2013 and it wasn't until a few years later mm. that I went on another trip mm-hmm. to France. A lot happened between 2013 and 2016 when I moved here. Yeah. And it was another trip I took. It was a trip um specifically to France because I was going to a wedding and I was supposed to go with an ex-boyfriend who's French. Mm-hmm. So living here we broke up. I was like, well, they're more my friends, so I'm mm-hmm. still going to go to the wedding. And I decided to just stay for another three weeks and do this whole eat pray love kind of French edition mm-hmm. kind of thing. And I, I I was basically like I had no plan. I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Annecy next. I'm going to go here next and mm-hmm. and I just did everything by myself and it was yeah. so liberating. And then I went back to Paris and I was like, I'm going to go to all the places that I went to with him and like make new memories for yeah. myself. And that whole trip, I just kept thinking, oh man, I I, just, I love food. I just want to cook forever. I want to do this. And it's always been my dream to go to like go to culinary mm-hmm. school just for a, a short course, yeah. like not really to become a But just cook. to try it and to be in that environment and see if it inspires you in a yeah. way, you know. And I mean, I told you earlier like from my early 20s they already mm-hmm. asked me, do you want to go to because yeah. I had an interest, but I think it was just this thing like So is is this when you make that decision? Yes, it was that trip where you're like I am going to go to culinary school. Yeah. So you end up coming back to the Philippines. Yes. You still have this job, but they end up kind of, you know, miraculously also downgrading. So in a way, you end up parting ways. Yes. And it's at this period where you really decide you know a few things happened during this period if i'm correct you kind of go through a dark period yeah i went through a, a depression like a really bad one it was like the first bad one i had since when i was 16 mm-hmm. when i went to therapy i i really feel like i do get anxiety and depression a lot like i'm very prone to it but i think the older i get the more i'm able to handle it so between 16 and mm-hmm. 34 i think i was going through little yeah you know like phases but it wasn't so bad until then it was really bad i was like it was so bad mm-hmm. i went down to like 45 kilos i think yeah and i think there were different elements that were playing into play like you had there was body dysmorphia there was a little bit of anorexia there was losing close friendships that yeah. were coming to an end which you know i think could take a toll on anyone yeah. it hurts more than a relationship we talked about this it hurts a friendship breakup hurts yeah. so much mm. a girl friendship or even you know with a guy friendship it's just it's hard yeah. because you build this you just there's this trust and you think yeah. this person we, we we're going to be together forever. forever like knitting like knitting, you know talking about everything like, family problems guy problems yeah. girl problems i mean you tell them about your relationship problems which in your head you're kind of always like relationships come and go yeah. i'm not saying that like i have a boyfriend now i'm not saying that i think it's not going to last i'm just saying that things happen things life, happen. life happens but like friends normally yeah. i think there's more of that expectation like no this is forever yeah. this is like a forever relationship and you know when that doesn't happen it's and very suddenly too like mm-hmm. bam i don't want to be your friend anymore and i'm yeah. just kind of like so you go through this really dark period and you know we can get deeper into that on another t- because it's such a such a deeper topic but you do end up getting out of it. You mm-hmm. write this article for this um national magazine or new- newspaper. newspaper and it really kind of helps you to process your emotions. Yeah. I'm not saying that you fully come out of it, but it seems like you do find your way out of it. You know, at this point, is this also when you start to take it more seriously that you want to pursue going to culinary school yeah. and then you really start looking at different places? Yeah. Okay. So what's that what was that process like? Who did you, you know, tell us about that? what you wrote and then how did you find your way to culinary school um so i wrote this article it's uh for the philippine daily inquirer i actually was a contributor to that newspaper so i would do lifestyle more mm. lifestyle articles for them and my editor like i i really loved her she she was my editor even from the magazine i worked i worked mm-hmm. for before she used to be there and then she she moved and i don't know she always trusted me to to write about mm-hmm. like 
important things. And by important, I don't mean serious all the time. Like she, she sent me to go interview Zac Efron in LA. Like it was a big trip and yeah. there are only like four media people invited, but I was one of them yeah. and you know, like things like that. So I really appreciated her. So like writing this article for the magazine and for her was really important to me. And mm-hmm. also I think I was so scared when I wrote it because I'm like, you know, you just, I'm not scared of being vulnerable, but it was just, too vulnerable it was like on a national level and just you know being scared that there there's mean people on the internet Mm -hmm. you know and we all deal with it yeah between having a famous dad who can be controversial because he's also very political Mm -hmm. we get a lot of stuff also as his kids and so yeah I, i write a little bit and i can understand to what extent it would be hard to manage because those actions are not necessarily reflective of you and then you have to deal with close friends or yeah. society maybe judging you for yeah. reasons that are beyond your control yeah. you know and this is like something that's me mm-hmm. you know and not just like my job or whatever it's like I'm burying my soul yeah but it was actually a really good decision to do that because I got so many emails and and messages from people who are like you know, I I think I'm depressed or or, but my family doesn't believe in therapy. Like all these things. And I also, it made me realize how lucky I was. Yeah. And it just made me feel good. Like I was like, even if I just affect one person, like I'll be happy. Yes. And that is so true. Even just one person, you think, oh my gosh, this person had a different journey. Yeah. Maybe a different thought simply because of the experience that I had, you know? Okay, so you write this this beautiful, you know, piece of work that is meaningful to you, even though you're scared. And does it help you to get out of that? Does it help you to some extent to get out of your that dark period in your life? Yeah, I think I wrote it. I was kind of not in the thick of it. I, I think the, artic- the article would have been completely different if I was. Mm-hmm. And it was good that I was like, at that time, I was already in therapy. Yeah. I was on meds. So I was more like, I can write about this yeah. and not be so like word vomit or like... You can manage your emotions properly yeah. and get them out in a way which would be constructive for other people to also exactly. utilize that. Like I find that, you know, people always say that I write, the, they, they can almost imagine me speaking. Like I see your voice a lot from your Instagram yeah. post to some of just the way that we've spoken before that you care a lot about the emotional aspect and your voice is definitely in those in those sentences and those words, you yeah. know? So take us to Cordon Bleu because your life changes, yeah. you know? You approach your family and you, you know, you tell them that you want to do this. Yeah. And I think they were really open and ready to help mm. you. So yeah. take us through that period. Um, so I was just like, I was still working at that time and I was just like, oh man. I, I don't know. It was just I I didn't hate the people I worked with. I loved the people I worked with. This wasn't the corporate job anymore. Mm-hmm. I remember I told you I, I did a startup yeah. right before moving here. And it was a beauty like startup. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, you know, this is so my thing and whatever. I enjoyed it, but I was just like, ah, I'm still working for somebody. And I'm still yeah. doing what I was doing for like so many years that I felt like I outgrew already. Like mm-hmm. it's not what I want to do anymore. And so I went up with I went up to them and I was just like, you know, like, do you remember when I was in my twenties and you guys yeah. asked me if I wanted to go to culinary school? Mm-hmm. Well, I kind of really no, I really, really want to go. Yeah. And you know, and in my head I'm like, I'm 35, what the hell am I doing? You know, like yeah. it's so unsure. I had like chef friends telling me not outrightly but like you're kind of too old to be doing Mm -hmm. this do you know how much physical labor this is it's Mm -hmm. not easy blah 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 and i'm like i know you know one of the reasons i really wanted to speak to you was specifically for this reason the first time i met you i remember you were very open about your age not very open but you wasn't something you were hiding no and we all know living in a society where once especially as a woman it's completely normal that at a certain age, people start to put you and categorize you yeah. that you are done and there's no longer the opportunities that were, were once there. Yeah. I feel like that's just so not true. Not for not for a woman and not for a man. And at 35, is you're just ripening. Mm. You're just getting to know yeah. 
yourself. You're going through all these emotional things, and now you can make a really intelligent decision exactly. about how you want to navigate your life and where you want to invest your energy.、Mm-hmm. And so, I actually think it's like a beautiful period, and you always have those people that are in your ears.、Yeah. But you decide. I'm gonna do this,、yeah. which is also your personality. You're a little <laughs> firecracker, Erica. So you were like, "I'm gonna do this."、Yeah. So like, watch me. <laughs> so you know, your Cordon Bleu is an expensive school, so this was a risk and a commitment. So you、yeah. go to your your uncles or your family members、yeah. and you ask them, and do they what What was their response to that? Honestly, like I, you know, I knew a lot of people also at like Cordon Bleu who. Kind of for doing a gap year, like they were young and everything, and they didn't know what to do. I went there like literally knowing exactly what I wanted to do. What did you study there exactly? I did the cuisine diploma. Okay, and 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 basic pastry as and well. And basic pastry. I did not want to do pastry, but I'm glad I did. Yes.、Uh, yeah, it was the chef Vaca. Actually, was like. Should do even、mm-hmm. just basic, and I was like, okay, I'll do basic pastry. Yeah. The whole time I'm, I'm like, I don't want to do this, but、yeah. you know, like I learned a lot too. And, and you were thinking, I'm gonna go back to the Philippines. Not、mm, really. Not really. Were you? What, what time were you like? I think I'm gonna stay in France. I, you know, at that time, like so, I went to Le Cordon Bleu, and then I did a few restaurants. You did Joël Robuchon, <laughs> yes. So, which was interesting because you mentioned also you loved it, but you didn't like working for someone else in general. I, I think it was just one. It's not my type of kitchen environment. Like it's very strict. Like you know the Michelin, like. Restaurants, like you know how it is,、mm-hmm. and it's it's amazing to watch and to actually it's militant. Also,、yeah. you're just exactly timed, and, yeah, and to experience and everything. But I was like, you know, at that point, I was like thirty six or thirty seven. I'm like, I am this age.、Mm-hmm. I I did not leave a career that I was unhappy with already to do something that I'm not happy with、yeah. either. You know, like. I just felt so. It was good. I don't、mm-hmm. get me wrong. Like experience wise, like、mm-hmm. I, I, it cannot be replaced by anything else. And I'm really glad that I went through it.、Mm-hmm. But it made me realize this isn't the path I want to take in cooking. So after that, I went to a, another restaurant. It wasn't Michelin or anything, but it was like traditional French and and. Same thing. I was like, maybe it's just the Michelin thing that I don't like. And then I went to more like a bistro, and I still didn't like it. And、mm. I was just like, you know what, Erica? Like, make a decision because you can't. You did culinary school. You went through all these things. You can't not be happy with what you're doing. Yes, and. It matters. It matters because when you're happy, the people around you are happy.、Mm-hmm. Your work feels better. You feel better. You、yeah. show up differently, and so you really do start looking inwards at this time where you're like, "What's going on?、Yeah. Like, I'm working around food. I'm working at these great restaurants. Why am I still like? Why am I not?、Ha- yeah. Not fully happy. I wasn't not happy. I just I knew it wasn't. This wasn't like you know, like in everything that you do, there's different. Categories or whatever, and I knew that this wasn't mine. Yes, but I had to experience it to know this. Absolutely. But I think it's also because coming from the Cordon Bleu and like knowing all these chefs and stuff, it's almost as if you're trained to feel like it's the only path. Absolutely. So I felt like I had to do this to like earn my stripes、mm-hmm. and for people to like believe in me or respect me、right. or whatever. And then after a while, I'm like, I don't give a crap. Like. I just want to cook and、yeah. make make myself happy and make people happy、mm-hmm. doing what I love. Like,、right. it's not a competition.、Mm-hmm. It's not like who can like not sleep for more days. Like、mm-hmm. that tends to happen in that world. Do you? So the pandemic happens. Yeah. So you've graduated Cordon Bleu. You've worked at a few, you know, incredible restaurants here in Paris. You're really in tune with yourself and the idea of like I'm. I need to figure something out that's really going to fulfill me. Yeah. But during the pandemic, you really take off because、yeah. everybody that I knew was talking about this fried chicken that you ended <laughs>、so、up、crazy. making. But you know, there's little things that happen in life that just put you on a whole different path, and people that didn't know about you. Suddenly get to know、mm-hmm. about you, and I think, of course, you make so many more dishes. There's so much more to you than that fried chicken. But during the pandemic, I think people really were attracted to what you were doing. It was just really good food that you were making. Do you feel like that was a little bit of a pivotal moment for your career? 
Definitely, yes. But, you know, after I, I stopped working in restaurants, I decided to do like private dinners and I was running a supper club from my apartment for a couple yeah. of years. And then I started doing pop ups, you know, like I was doing I did a um, greenhouse when it was still Kristen and then um, Botanero. Yeah, it's the street of Frances now and Le Foodie. Like, yeah, yeah. And that's where we met. Yes. And, you know, and all those things, I, I started like kind of putting myself out there. But I think it was during the pandemic that I think because every everything was just shut down mm -hmm. and there were very few of us cooks that were kind of doing something mm -hmm. like that didn't have restaurants. You know what I mean? That were just like, you know what, I'm going to do deliveries or takeaways. Yeah. And I don't think number one, doing delivery food has to be like a little more simple. Mm -hmm. Things need to travel. So you have to think of a thing that is going to be easy for you to produce like large amounts of easy to, yeah. you know, stays good and whatever. And in my my pop-ups before that, I was already doing the fried chicken. I knew people liked it. So I'm like, you know what? Like, but actually before that, I was doing it on, sorry, before the first, like after the first lockdown, when we were locked down for two mm -hmm. months, I was cooking from my house mm -hmm. and then we and then we were in lockdown again and I had moved already to another apartment then I couldn't cook from there and I was like what am I gonna do mm -hmm. that's like when my friend Carlos and I um you know Carlos yeah absolutely when uh we're just like we need to find something mm -hmm. found a kitchen and ended up doing takeaways he was doing taco kits and I was like I'm going to do fried chicken. Everybody likes my fried chicken, so I'm just going to do it. Yeah. And then I came up with like five or six sauces for it. Yeah. And I, I have to pause real quick and tell everyone <laughs> how good this fried chicken is. I just, it was, it was such a highlight of the pandemic life <laughs> because I remember I went, I got this box and I just opened it and I ate it right there and it was so, so good. And again, Erica makes so many incredible dishes and your flavors and just you know, everything, the way that you bring it together is incredible. And I'm so excited, yeah. I think like many people, to go to Reina, you know, I'm excited and try to it. have everybody there. Yeah. Honestly, like last night we did our first service, but it was like a friends and family thing. And yes. It was just so exhilarating too. So this is the part which I love a lot because there's a part of this podcast that I, I love entrepreneurship. I love business podcasts. I love understanding how someone build something. Mm -hmm. And one of the main reasons of doing this podcast is because I am a huge fan of Guy Raz. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he has this podcast called How I Built This. And he talks with so many entrepreneurs from like Spanx to various like Tinder or yeah. Bumble on how they began. And it's very generous storytelling. And there's a part of the podcast that I wanted to dedicate to someone who's a, you know, running their own business and ask you really specific questions. And one of them was, um, what's one lesson your job has taught you that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life? Because getting, buying a place in Paris to run your own restaurant, mm. there's the finance part, there's the hiring people, there's constantly thinking about food going bad and yeah. the bookings. So what's one lesson where you're like, this is something that I have learned that everybody should know in general? for someone who was opening up their own restaurant soon? Well, I think number one, time management, for sure. I'm lucky I learned this pretty early because I had a kid. That's, and that's exactly I it. I really had to. And patience and letting go. Those three things. Letting go of what? Of expectations, letting go of it has to be like this, perfection. Like, mm. you know, like things happen. And sometimes like if you dwell on it not just in the kitchen but on anything you're just honestly like you're just gonna be angry all the time or resentful mm -hmm. and sometimes you just have to move i'm not saying that if something bad happens you can't be angry about it mm -hmm. or you can't like you know stand up for yourself or whatever but it can't be something that is like that you kind of keep in your heart because once something gets planted there it grows yeah and it has an effect on the overall ecosystem yeah. of where you're you know are What's been the hardest thing about opening up your own restaurant? Waiting for people. I know I said patience earlier and that's why I said it's important. It's mm -hmm. like, you don't understand. Last Yesterday when we did the friends and family thing, we were literally 
still building things an hour before mm-hmm. people came mm-hmm. because people were like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it, you know, on Thursday and they come on, on Saturday and mm-hmm. you have no control of things. So you really just have to be like, it is what it is. Right. You know, patience, acceptance, letting go, like mm-hmm. you making do with what you have. I've worked in so many different kitchens. I actually have issues with my kitchen now. Like mm-hmm. um, I won't have gas for the next two weeks. So I had to buy inductions and adapt my menu. And it's annoying. And mm-hmm. I have, you know, bitched about it. But yeah. at the end of the day, I'm like... You know, when we start something in our lives, like a new business specifically, everyone around us is either really encouraging or you have the people that think, oh my gosh, I'm warning you. Maybe you don't want to get into this. I imagine you had a bit of both. Yeah. But now that you are in the thick of it, that you are running the show, you know, there's money involved. And I imagine that you think about that. Like, what if this does well? What if it doesn't do well? It's always very charming and great when people share your stories Mm -hmm. on Instagram. Those things are great. But at the end of the day, are you, do those concerns as a businesswoman now, you know, are you thinking about them more? Are you thinking about how is this going to do well? What if it doesn't do well? What if I have reservations? What if I don't? Or are you more the type of entrepreneur where right now you say, I'm just going to go with this and see how it goes? No, definitely the the former. Mm. I am a very emotion driven person. And, you know, like my business partner now, he's more like logical and whatever. And he kind of keeps me grounded. And, you know, it's so great that he he lets me like if I'm like angry or like stressed about something, he calms me down. Like he knows how to like yeah. be the voice of reason, which is great. I definitely get imposter syndrome all the time. That was all the time. I wanted to kind of end this podcast in a way with this interview with you was, do you feel like a chef? But before we do that, I wanted you to finish your thought of what you were saying, because those worries and running a business are there yeah. and they're valid and it's fun. You know, your mom's here, everyone's mm. there. But I imagine that there is always this idea of, I want it to do well. I want it to do real. I want the food to be well. I want the people to enjoy. Mm. So do you find yourself thinking about those things more now? Or is it just like, I'm going to focus on the food and, and, you know, let's see how this goes. Well, I have to think about it. Even if I just want to focus on the food, it's hard not to. Like, yeah. Um, my sous chef is, is really good and she's worked with me before so she knows my my flavor she knows the recipe so like mm-hmm. yesterday I was like spend time in the kitchen do these sauces yeah. I'm gonna help in the salad and like get things ready like I know I can leave her and I think being able to find people to work with that you can trust is very important yeah. and also yeah like the imposter syndrome is super real I am constantly so do is- you feel like a chef Erica? I don't know yet. I don't know. Don't ask me that question. It's interesting, right? I think we all go through it and I wonder, I mean, I've read about this. I, It's fascinating because you're a trained chef and <laughs> we still don't feel that we are what we've actually learned for some reason. What do you think it is? I think, like, I can only speak for myself and I think a lot of people, well, maybe, maybe not, correct me if I'm wrong, but... People who didn't take the traditional path always don't feel quite like validated in what they're in what they're. Yeah, and you know, I'm always like, everyone's just like, someone's like, like, "Hi, chef," and I'm like, "Are you? Who are you talking to?" Right. You know, and it's. Well, you are a chef. For (laughs) me, you're a chef. You make incredible food. There's so many other principles that you've learned about being a chef, but. I understand. It's, I can't it's even there. put chef on my Instagram yeah. name because I know a lot of chefs mm-hmm. do, and it's good because, like, when you're looking for someone on yeah. Instagram, you want to know. Okay, it's it's this person. This is chef whoever. Yeah. I can't. You can't get there yet, huh? No. Wow. I and understand. I'm not saying I'm not proud of what I've accomplished, but I think like I don't know what it is. I mm-hmm. think I I want to continue just feeling like. This is my passion and I love yeah. it and I'm enjoying it. And when it starts getting, even if it's just labels, yeah, it becomes like, I don't know, work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have a few more questions before we wrap this up. One is, what's your favorite productivity hack for entrepreneurs? Do you have one through this whole process? <sighs> yes. Uh, and I don't always follow this. <laughs> 
try not to do too many things at the same time. I think like make a mm-hmm. list and really try to make a list according to priority, mm-hmm. not just a random list. And you're like, oh, I'll do whatever I feel like today, because I think if you write down what's really important that needs to get done, like yeah. it will finally get done. Honestly, my boyfriend and my business partner are constantly hounding me like, where's this, where's this? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll get it done. Mm-hmm. But when I'm doing like a pop-up and then there's the restaurant stuff and they want this, like I'm, I feel like, and I'm a mom, yeah. you know, and my boyfriend always reminds me, you're, you're a mom, you're a partner, you're this and that, you're not just like a chef. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah, I know. I know it in my head, but like, mm-hmm. you know, it's hard. So I think making lists and not trying not to spread yourself too thin. Okay, that's a good one. That's a good one because we can get to that point where it's like, I've got to do all this. And it's if you just focus on mm. one or two things. Like, I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, yes, you're like saying yes to everybody. Absolutely. And June, my, my boyfriend's always like, focus on the restaurant. Mm-hmm. This is the most important thing right now. I know so many people are asking you to do a collaboration, to do this. And mm-hmm. he's like, forget everything, at least for the first six months when you feel more comfortable, yeah. then you can start. But this is your baby. You need to take care of it. Yeah. And I'm like, you're right. Well, thank you <laughs> so much for being here. I'm genuinely so, so glad that I got to sit down with you, Erica. You've been someone that I think inspires and you maybe you don't even know it, but you're constantly inspiring with the ways that you're, you know, you have dealt with your business through the pandemic, which I thought was just, I saw you going into different places and, you know, really making it work for you to now opening up your own restaurant. Oh, you're a mom, you know, you're, there's just so many elements that I think are so beautiful. And I want to acknowledge you for that because you do inspire through your restaurant opening on your Instagram, your words, I read them on your Instagram posts. They're, they're so long sometimes. But that, it's, you know, it's, again, it goes back to who you are. You are a writer as well. You're like, you know, that's a part of you. So let's end with just a few fun questions. Okay. Ready? Some rapid fire questions. Oh my God, I'm so All bad right. at this. <laughs> TikTok or Instagram? Instagram. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Okay, um, McDonald's or Burger King? McDonald's. Oh. Chicken nuggets mm-hmm. for life. <laughs> Pepsi or Coke? Coke. Cherry Coke. Mm-hmm. Dr. Pepper, though. Okay. <laughs> um, tennis or basketball? Basketball. Basketball or football? Basketball. Oh. <laughs> France or the Philippines? Oh my oh. God. <laughs> when I'm here, I'll say Philippines. When I'm in the Philippines, I'll say France. So that's, that's a, a trick question. That's a good answer. <laughs> well, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to be here. I can't wait for people to go and try Reina because I keep talking about it. And so am I saying that correctly? Yes. Okay, so let's end this and tell us why did you name it Reina? So Reina means queen in Filipino. And it's really, you know, me um, paying tribute to my grandma and all the women that raised me. And, 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 and yourself. <laughs> and yeah, me hoping to be the same influence they had on yeah. me to future generations. Because I honestly think that, you know, now is the time for women to, I think, yeah. just step up and take what we deserve. Mm-hmm. Because I think growing up as a girl, I was always like almost afraid to mm-hmm. claim things. Yeah. And I'm not anymore. No, you're definitely <laughs> not. And that's why I think there's so many elements, I mean, if not all elements of you that are really inspiring that I think people see. And so, you know, it's not just about the restaurant. When a restaurant opens, yes, it's great, but I wanted to highlight who you were because every time I've talked to you, there's just always been a lot of passion, there's struggle, there's also a lot of joyous things that have happened in your life. And I think when someone knows you better, they can also really enjoy the experience of Reina. Yeah. So I think Reina should just be like a really joyful place. Great. It's almost an extension of my supper club. Yeah. That's how I want it. Although I saw the long table. That looks great. Yeah. So although my accountant will say, no, it's a business. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll let my business partner do it. Definitely, with that. <laughs> definitely. Well thank you for being here. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. <laughs>